Hello, I'm Rebecca Lewington. Welcome to our podcast. I'm thrilled to be here with Barton Fisk from NVIDIA, who looks after high performance computing alliances, and Wes Vasky, Principal Storage Solutions Engineer at Micron. They've been working together on a new NVIDIA technology called GPU Direct Storage, which not a lot of people have heard of. This is a shame because it's a really clever way to overcome data movement bottlenecks increasingly found in our traditional computing architecture to keep graphics processing units, which are indispensable these days for training AI models, fed with the data they crave. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining me. Sure, thanks. So first, Barton, tell us a bit about yourself. What's your background and what's your current role? So I'm a senior alliances manager with NVIDIA. I've been here almost six years now. Um, primarily, I look after the HPC development tool chain. So that would include compilers, debuggers, profilers, uh, special purpose languages, and uh, more recently, I've uh, been also supporting the GPU Direct team in implementations of GPU Direct RDNA, and most recently, GPU Direct Storage. Excellent. And Wes, how about you? Yeah, I'm a principal storage solutions engineer here at Micron. Uh, my team and I do application performance testing, primarily enterprise applications against our uh, data center and VME SSD products. Uh, I've been at Micron for about six years. Before that, uh, I was doing this somewhere else. I've got like a decade of experience doing this. And most recently, uh, I've been focused on examining the storage requirements for AI workloads. And that has pushed me over to working with NVIDIA pretty closely and GPU direct storage for about the past year, year and a half. Excellent. Well, I'm sorry you had to be pushed into working with NVIDIA. I thought it was something you might quite like. <laughs> okay. It was, it was a fun push. <laughs> so, Barton, let's start at the very beginning. Why are graphics processing units so good at training AI models? Graphics processing units suggest they were invented for something else entirely. Sure. So it's it's perhaps a, a little bit uh, of an overloaded term these days, but it essentially boils down to um, the ability of GPUs to accelerate uh, the algorithms, the, the computing uh, elements of the artificial intelligence uh, pipeline. Um, basically, it boils down to matrix multiply in most cases um, and enhanced math operations. Uh, CPUs are designed to be just that, central processing units, so they do a wide variety of things, but following the Pareto rule of uh, perhaps 80-20 or even more, um, it sometimes works out that a, a GPU is going to be a much faster implementation of accelerating an algorithm than just relying on a CPU. So uh, in the case of machine learning and deep learning, where matrix multiply is very heavily used, uh, an accelerator will have a significant impact on um, the ability to complete those operations. Gotcha. So it's almost a convenient accident that what was developed for one thing turns out to be really, really useful for another thing. Indeed. So second obvious question, what is GPU direct and what is GPU direct storage? Sure. So the idea is um, when you're operating on data, you want to bring it as close to uh, the accelerator as possible. And so uh, the traditional way of working with an accelerator is to take the data from main memory, copy it to uh, the accelerator, and then operate on it. Um, the notion of GPU direct allows for data to be copied directly into the GPU and operated either across a network fabric, in the case of GPU direct RDMA, uh, allowing for uh, massive scaling of those kinds of workloads. And then uh, further, we've taken it uh, to allow for the ability uh, for network connected storage or locally attached storage to write directly into GPU memory uh, and bypassing um, the bounce buffer in the CPU, which uh, reduces latency in the system and increases throughput overall. Right. So you're kind of effectively taking a middleman out of the loop, out of the data path. As much as possible. There's some control path that stays there, but uh, the vast majority of the data is allowed to flow directly from storage into GPU memory and then operated on. Uh, and then, if necessary, transfer it out again using the same protocols. Gotcha. And there's one thing you said there I think is worth explore, just exploring for a second. You refer to an accelerator. Now, you mean GPU is a kind of accelerator, but why did you use that term rather than just GPU? Um, well, if you compare the throughput uh, that a GPU can uh, produce uh, versus the equivalent CPU, uh, it has the effect of accelerating uh, the, the overall rate of calculation. Right, but you could. Like, there are more kinds of accelerators than just GPUs, right? Sure, there's network acceleration. Uh, so uh, 
Mellanox is uh, known for making offload uh, devices that accelerate network throughput. And uh, that's another part of the solution that we bring. Right, gotcha. Okay, so now that's what GPU storage is. Um, why do we actually need this? What was wrong with the old way of doing it? I mean, this is a little wasteful on clock cycles, but was it actually a problem? It solves, uh, well, it addresses a common uh, sort of uh, comical statement we make about uh, HPC, which is, HPC is the process of taking a compute bound workload and turning it into an IO bound workload. Uh, and so uh, in lots of processing uh, across a variety of domains, you'll see that uh, very often, for example, in uh, machine learning, the extract, transform, and load process, or in HPC, just loading up from the data lake uh, can take a significant portion of the total processing time. So the idea is to essentially uh, accelerate not just the compute itself, but the loading of the data into the accelerator. Right, it's not a lot of point having the fastest accelerator in the world if you if it's waiting around for data. Correct. Right. So Wes, um, how how do you connect storage to the accelerators using GPU Direct Storage? Yeah, so I'd say that there's three main ways that you can connect storage uh, to to a system with GPUs that you can use with GPU Direct Storage. Uh, the first is sort of the basic trivial case of local NVMe drives in a system. Um, it's well understood at this point. The main problem with that is you're limited with storage capacity just by the number of drive slots that you have in a system. The, the second option is going to be something like NVMe over fabrics or NVMe OF. Uh, what's great about that is that you're just taking NVMe drives, uh, setting them up remotely, presenting them over the network. Uh, there's various solutions to do that and we'll discuss one of these. Um, but it, it makes it real easy to just connect additional storage by using your network while getting the benefits of NVMe. The third option is going to be a sort of file system based options like VAST, WACA, DDN, and some others uh, that NVIDIA and us are working with. Uh, these solutions are similar to NVMe OF in that they are remote storage. You can use NVMe drives. The primary benefit that they're going to bring, though, is support for simultaneous reads and writes from multiple hosts at the same time. And which, whichever one of these is going to be the best solution for you is really going to be dependent on your use case. Uh, so like I said, local NVMe, uh, that's well understood. Limited capacity, generally used as um, like a cache for an individual compute node. Uh, NVMe OF is great if you need to extend capacity that um, needs to handle a lot of reads for multiple hosts, but not writes, uh, just because two hosts can't write at the same time. Um, and the, the file system pieces are going to be great when you do need those simultaneous read and write access to the same data from multiple places. Right. Now, tell me a bit more about the F part. Mm -hmm. uh, fabrics. What, what do you mean by fabric? Yeah, so fabric is the whole ecosystem around NVMe uh, over fabrics is actually really interesting in the way that it's gotten to where it is. Uh, the fabric pieces are actually just built in now to the standard NVMe driver. So if you have NVMe support that's modern in a normal OS, it also supports the over fabric piece. For us, fabric means Ethernet. That's what we're using. But really, it can be any fabric. It can work over InfiniBand. It can work over Fiber Channel, uh, just depending on the specific uh, sort of network that you want to be using to, to transfer your data. In our case, we're using a, a specific hardware piece called an EBOF, or Ethernet Attached Bunch of Flash. Uh, so it gives us a chassis. We put drives in it. There are switches in the back. And these drives basically get passed through uh, now as Ethernet-based devices. Right. Very simple. Each drive gets get each drive gets an IP address, mm -hmm. and it can write be written to um, read read from directly from the the GPU store, GPU direct storage system. Exactly. And uh, so your testing, how, what was your test setup, and how did it work? Yeah. So the test setup that I've got, like I said, I've got an EBOF. That's a two U chassis. I can put twenty four drives in the front. I have two switches in the back, yeah, so it's going to be about that big inside your uh, data center in your rack. The client that I'm using to drive load against this is an NVIDIA DGX A100. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar, the DGX A100 is a dual socket, so it has two 64-core CPUs in it. Uh, it has eight of NVIDIA's latest A100 data center GPUs. 
Uh, in our lab, we refer to it as the Beast 2.0, because <laughs> this is the uh, second big GPU system uh, that we've been working with. Uh, and the, the drive that we're uh, testing with this is the Micron 7300 NVMe SSD. Uh, it's sort of our quote unquote mainstream NVMe drive. We, we have the 9000 series, which is gonna offer more performance. The reason we use the 7300 though, the performance of that real closely aligns with the limits of a 25 gig ethernet port. And these drives, when we put them into the eBuff, basically get trans, um, translated to a 25 gig ethernet port. So we, we've got a good match in terms of uh, top end capabilities on the ethernet side and top end capabilities on the drive side. Gotcha. And how fast was it? <laughs> uh, it is quite fast. So I, I do like to sort of separate the performance into two, uh, let's call them IO domains. So if we look at the small block use case, so let's say I'm looking at 4K transfers. Uh, for most users, if you're looking at small block, you're interested in obviously throughput IOPS and performance, but also latency. You want to know how quickly you can get those individual blocks transferred. And with testing on the eBuff, when we switch from the traditional data path and enable GPU direct storage, we increase our top end throughput by a little more than four times, uh, which is a pretty big increase. And along with that increase in performance, we're seeing latency reductions anywhere from 10 to 70%, depending on how heavy the load was. On the, the other IO domain uh, is gonna be large block transfers. And for that, we, we generally don't need to look at latency because most of the latency is going to be the actual transfer of data, uh, not sort of managing the transfer. But what we do benefit from, in addition to the throughput increases, is a reduction in CPU utilization. And this is one of those numbers that's in a lot of the materials that NVIDIA has, has covered. And it's still surprising when I see just how big the magnitude of the change is. So when I'm looking at large block throughput, uh, I can get about 83% higher throughput uh, on the eBuff when we enable GPU direct storage first not using it. That's a pretty big increase. With CPU utilization though, with the traditional data path, as we increase the load, the CPU utilization goes right up with that to the point where you can effectively saturate your CPUs just waiting for I.O. to complete. And in the DGX A100 with 256 logical cores, that's a lot of CPU uh, using just to move bits. As soon as we enable GPU direct storage, uh, we're limited to around seven or eight cores being used out of those 256. Uh, that's a reduction on the order of 95, 96% reduction in CPU utilization. So that's, that's CPU that you can use for pre or post processing tasks uh, instead of just trying to move these bits around. That's amazing. And it, I think this is really interesting because we talk a lot, well, they talk a lot in the HPC world about bringing balance to the system, mm -hmm. eliminating bottlenecks, having the, having the data movement, balance the speed of the process elements, and that just with just with some software changes here, you've achieved these amazing results and all different kinds of data you know, patterns is amazing. So Barton, what does this mean for real life applications and use cases? You've had a great example you mentioned when we talked before. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, one of the, the ones we like to refer to is a, a simulation of what it will be like to uh, put a craft on, uh, land a craft on Mars with uh, six folks attached um, somewhere in the next five to seven years. Uh, so to do that, um, NASA uses um, GPUs and, and large-scale compute uh, systems to generate data of that simulation, uh, multiple dimensions of data uh, that they're calculating and then storing. And ultimately, what they want is a way to visualize that, to actually be able to see what the effects of the Martian atmosphere will be on the craft as it goes through, uh, as it goes through entry. And so uh, that was an enormous amount of data that got generated uh, during our, our demo session at uh, Supercomputing 2019. We actually uh, were able to load that data into uh, a live system uh, and visualize it and display it in real time, which was at the time the largest volume visualization uh, that we know of uh, ever attempted. Um, and so using GP direct storage, we were able to take data directly from those storage drives uh, and put them into system memory and then access and display them at, at rates that were not previously uh, 
thought possible. That's amazing. Yeah, you said something that it allowed them to both look at their data all at once, all the phenomena all at once, and also move them from doing offline things that took weeks to things that just to take hours to do. And that's a that's a huge deal. Yeah, you can find that uh, demo on our website if you just search for NVIDIA and Mars Lander visualization. Excellent. I'll put a link in the description below this when people find this find this find this interview. So I have to ask, what's it been like working with Wes and with Micron? Oh, we've been uh, together on this journey since uh, the very alpha days, the very beginning. So um, I, I think what we've enjoyed is is the close collaboration, uh, a very high degree of technical skill and 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 competency, uh, and the ability to. Um, Kind of test our ideas out in an independent lab, if you will. Um, you know, obviously we're collaborating, but uh, it's one thing for Nvidia to generate results and and use cases and, and analysis in our uh, labs, but it's 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 another to have an independent party just uh, collaborate with us and and show us that the things we're trying to achieve actually you know do have concrete benefits and uh, to the, the overall compute um, compute world. So uh, I, I think back and forth uh, we continue to. Um, enhance our skills and make uh, GP Direct Storage uh, better for it. Excellent. And and Wes, I, and for you, what's it been like working with NVIDIA? Let me just go and mute Barton Speakers. <laughs> so I'm 100% a hardware nerd, uh, even back in the days of overclocking and benchmarking my gaming system. So being able to uh, sort of grow that professionally and uh, be able to use just the awesome hardware that we're talking about here. Like the DJX A100 is a pretty extreme machine. Uh, so that, that's pretty sweet. And then being able to pair that with sort of the leading edge software development that NVIDIA is doing on this uh, is, is just bonus on top of that. So it's been great being able to work on this. Excellent. So just to finish off, Barton, how can people get started with Jupyter Direct and Jupyter Direct Storage? Simple as going to developer.nvidia.com. Uh, and uh, if you don't have an account, uh, they're quickly turned around. Uh, we just uh, have you apply for one, fill out some fields. And then uh, the GP Direct Storage documentation is available to anyone. So you could start at docs.nvidia.com and search for GP Direct Storage. We just refer to it as GDS for short. Uh, and uh, the most recent download uh, is available on the developer pages. Uh, we're currently at V095, which will be released this month, and we're headed towards a major release, a GA release later this year. Excellent. And um, you also said something about uh, making APIs, I think, available at some point? Well, we're exposing GP Direct Storage as uh, an extension of CUDA. Uh, so ah. it will be the CU file operator uh, is the, the logical construct that a developer would use to uh, undertake uh, these sorts of uh, mappings, if you will, of data into GPU memory. So uh, it's it's literally as simple as that. Uh, we provide a code sample in the documentation that isn't more than about 40 lines long, which shows a complete uh, module that uh, opens a file and reads and writes data to it and closes it using the group file operator. Excellent. So developers out there, go to video and start your engines. Wes, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, so for the next few months, I'm going to be doing more testing, more talking. Uh, so I've got a presentation at NVIDIA's GTC conference where I will go a little bit more in depth into the EBOF and using it with a DGX A100, more performance data, more best practices, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I'm going to be moving on to characterizing application workloads. A lot of the data that I have so far is with synthetic benchmarks, uh, which does help you when you're trying to size and discover new hardware. Uh, but it's for a lot of customers, they're going to want to see the, well, what does this do for me, for my applications, for the workloads that we're running? So I'll be exploring that as well next. Great. And it's worth mentioning that um, these two were on a webinar last week, um, talking in much more detail about all of this, and we'll include a link um, in the description for this podcast as well. So, gentlemen, this has been really, really interesting. Thank you very, very much. This is terribly exciting. And I wish you all the best with uh, more of this stuff in the future. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, guys.